um, act, but it is very problematic. Um, for, one, for one thing, it requires people to travel to the country where they might be arrested, which so they're unlikely like, to I mean, Pinochet was here for quite a while, wasn't he, before things clarified? Yeah, and, 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 and that, as you, you know, as you know, it was incredibly controversial. Um, since Pinochet, there has, there has been a, an evolution in the law on universe, universal jurisdiction. In some countries, Belgium is one of them, have been um, quite active. Spain is incredibly active. Um, and I know that the Israeli government is, is actively retaining lawyers in Madrid to try and prevent Spanish prosecutors um, prosecuting Israelis. So um, that is an area of activity, but it's not perfect. One, because it's not necessarily balanced, whereas this report would lead to referrals on both sides to the ICC. Um, universal jurisdiction is random and depends on particular lawyers in particular countries going after particular individuals. I know that it's causing a lot of um, controversy in Israel, and, it, and it, it, it doesn't help perceptions of bias, which I think is the potential strength of this report, and why it's such a shame that it's not really being taken seriously. Yeah, when you do actually get side. people in front of the international court, like the, like the, the Serbian leaders, then, then the whole thing spun out for years and years, and it becomes almost impossible to, to get any resolution, even if you actually get them into an international court. It's a very difficult system. Well, I think it's worth remembering that the International Criminal Court is still in its infancy, um, mm. but that it also is riddled yeah. with problems. And, and one of the problems is that all of its cases so far have been um, against Africans, um, which is, is causing problems in Africa and uh, making people question its... It's, it's relevant to situations like the one in Israel. Well, it's more biased. Philippa, what did you make of the, the panel's response? Yeah. Uh, well, I was quite interested to, to, by the answers of Mr. Lee and uh, Ms. Uh, Hirsch. Is, uh, I'd ask Mr. Lee, did the 20 investigations, ongoing investigations, has the Goldstone report anything to do with those? Because we saw... Um, uh, I, Israeli Defense Force spoke people explaining alleged uh, prima facie cases of war crimes uh, un under, you know, sort of brushing them off. And uh, is the Goldborn uh, report having this effect by, by causing this investigation in Israel? And is the universal jurisdiction um, causing Israel to... Um, for, for example, I understood that prior to the invasion starting, uh, the Israeli Defense Force changed its rules of publications of names of officers and uh, asked that all officers except the top rank, uh, I mean, probably you know the specifics, but it was reported in the international press that uh, the, the international yeah. defense force kept names of middle rank officers anonymous okay. due to the risk I mean, of I mean, I think because not, not all countries have signed up, I and mean, the French, for example, won't have their military exam. They, they, they have a, 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 a get-out clause from that. But what, what do you make of that, this accusation that Israel's doing this but not being as open as it should be and thorough as it should be? Is that fair? Well, firstly, you asked the connection of the Goldstone report to the internal Israeli investigations. There is no connection. Israel launched its investigations following the war. In fact, during the war, when the white phosphorus allegations came out, the Israelis announced that we believe that some, some of our forces used them inappropriately. So these yeah, the first report by your spokespeople was that no phosphorus report right. was used. And the, and the, the There's the no phosphorus weapons were used. That is, was right. propaganda during the war. Yeah, during, during, during the war. That's, 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 that's the fact. Phosphorus you know, if you want me to answer, used. you can't both be yelling at me Come and staring yeah, yeah, You've got to give me a chance to get a word in. Look, Israel responded during the war to the allegations of white phosphorus, obviously responded in different, you know, over time as news came out, and every, every uh, country spins its news, but they did admit that there's probable misuse of white phosphorus, and those, that's part of the investigation. In fact, the Israeli investigation is broader than Goldstone's. There's cases they invest, there's more cases, specific cases they investigate that Goldstone knows nothing about, and their investigation predates Goldstone. As for the Israeli officers hiding their names or whatever, uh, Israel should take precautions. I think an Israeli officer who gets invited, if Ehud Barak, for example, gets invited to come to Britain, I don't think he should face the risk of arrest, and Israel should take precautions against it. I do think in some cases, actually in this case I would disagree with the Israeli government, I think we, we should send, Israel should send officers who were involved in Gaza to places like Britain or Belgium or Spain and risk arrest, and if necessary, stand trial and test those cases. Because I think in a, in a court of law, in a democracy, Israel's, uh, Israel's officers would come out okay. I'd like to bring James McNeil in, who's got a relevant question to the point Eric's just been making. James, your question. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, could uh, the Israeli Defense Minister Barak be arrested in Europe? And you alluded to that so far early on. I mean, is, is there a, a serious danger that some senior Israeli government ministers, if they come into Europe, are, are going to find themselves detained? 
Absolutely. Yeah. I think... Um, That's a real possibility. It is a real possibility. Yeah. The way the law has evolved so far, there's still a distinction between um, official visits and unofficial visits. So um, General Almog was visiting the UK in his personal capacity when he was um, threatened with arrest. Um, Barack came to on official visits to meet the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary, and therefore it's more, it's, it's, it's more questionable whether he could have been arrested um, because of diplomatic immunity and, and this divide in law between personal and private visits. But it's a real possibility, and I know that precautions are being taken in Israel. And I'm, I'm interested to hear your view, um, which is also my view, that um, if there is no viable case against individuals, then let them come and stand trial. We have a robust um, legal system, and if they're innocent, they'll be acquitted. So I, to me, the measures that are being taken to avoid any possible arrest um, is, is undermines um, the argument that they're innocent. Although, of course, realistically, nobody wants to be arrested and stand trial if they believe they're innocent. But I do think that's a serious possibility and um, something we're likely to see happen in future. I'm increasingly listening to the, this conversation. It makes me believe more and more that uh, what I believe in about boycotts. A boycott usually means that you're not there at the table when the decisions are made. And I think the boycott that Israel has made on the Goldstone Report is allowing everybody else to make hay whilst Israel sits there un unable to defend itself. It needs to be at the table. So I think that increasingly I'm beginning to realize that, that uh, Israel made a mistake, I think. Whatever the reasons they may have had, they may have considered they were valid or not. I don't know. But I think it's, it's, be, it's actually rebounding on them very badly. I mean, Eric, you're, you're here as an, an, an informed observer rather than the spokesman for the Israeli Sorry. government. I appreciate that. But, I mean, do you think politically this is going to be a problem? I mean, it would be one thing sending a, a, an obscure major to stand trial. It would be another thing to see a, a, an Israeli defence minister, for example, detained at Heathrow Airport. I mean, do you think this is a serious stuff or is this just all probably his job as soon as he got here, actually. <laughs> Look, first of all, it's, it's completely unfair in the world we live in. I'm looking at the gentleman who mentioned the war, the war on terror and the wars going on in Afghanistan and Iraq now, that Israelis and only Israelis at the moment really seem to face this risk. Israelis travel a lot to Europe and to America. Israel has a lot of commerce and business with these countries. And we're allies, we're democracies. And the thought that only Israeli officers in the world face this risk of being arrested in Belgium or in Spain makes no sense. Why not British officers? Why not American officers? So if you want to start arresting everybody in every country, in every army that's ever committed a war crime, you're going to arrest every person who's ever served in an army anywhere in the world, going back to the but Second it's World not, War. it's not true to say only Israelis. I mean, we've had Rwandan genocidaires um, arrested in other countries for crimes they were alleged to have committed in Rwanda in the genocide. Um, and I think universal jurisdiction is a tool that's being used across the board. Um, but I agree, and I think that's one of the problems. It's not ideal for random countries.